the central focus here is the process of aging and the damage accumulation that happens with aging and the resulting chronic diseases. Any kind of intervention, any kind of diagnostics falls within this wide vertical. And then what is our investment thesis? Our investment thesis is longevity therapeutics, diagnostics, that also includes biomarkers, aging clocks, and many more. And the lens that we invest with, one, innovation. So we need to have protectable innovation, specifically from an IP perspective, as well as an innovation that creates an inflection point within the vertical, which progresses the vertical. And we also look for human impact, because the bigger the human impact, the better the uh, field as such progresses, as a whole progresses. And then we specifically look at the founding team and you'll understand as you hear more from Daniel, who is on this panel as to why we believe in the founding teams of our portfolio companies and how we pick these and how amazing these founders are. Our specialty is end-to-end -end support. We do not only provide capital, we also provide support um, to the portfolio companies. We have two funds, one out of which we have invested into about more than 40 companies, again, in the field of therapeutics, longevity therapeutics, as well as diagnostics. And we, uh, as we speak, we're raising the funds too. And then people ask us often, why are we trying to raise another fund in this market condition? But to me, Healthcare innovation always stays afloat despite market conditions. And this might overly seem simplistic or highly optimistic, but the history has shown that this is true and it's provided, history has provided us several data points. And uh, we have, at the Longevity Tech Fund, we are especially proud of our, uh, uh, the teams and our portfolio companies and we're presenting one such company today called Sampling Human. Interesting name, right? And then we, uh, we have its founding member, Daniel, who is uh, one of our exemplary founders. And I will go through a quick round of introduction to who I am, maybe a line or two, and then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Raga, who's on the panel. Uh, I am Jyoti, and my interest and expertise is in two specific fields. Um, I wouldn't say two because they all merge within longevity, but for sake of convenience, I would say it is uh, regenerative medicine and longevity. Over to you, Raghav. Um, thank you, Jyoti. I'm Raghav Segal. I'm a venture consultant at LTF. I'm also a PhD student at Yale, and I study biomarkers of aging, and which is why Daniel's conversation today is very interesting to me personally. Uh, so I'm really looking forward uh, to our chat today, Daniel. Jyoti, Raghav, hello. <laughs> Hi, chat. Uh, it's, uh, no, this is, a, this is a lot of fun. When uh, Jyoti, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I know when we last met in Palo Alto, the, you know, the conversations went on for hours. Unfortunately, today we only have, you know, 45 minutes, but I think it's going to be a good time again. Uh, uh, so a little bit of an introduction about myself. Uh, although these days I'm, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Sampling Human. I'm a CEO of Sam I'm the CEO of Sampling Human. Sort of going back, I've, I've uh, uh, been a, a complexity nut from the beginning. Uh, basically, anything that had the the name complex in it, I always felt like you know that, that's where the opportunity is. That's where the questions are. And uh, you know boy is you know biology complex right so there's a lot of lot of things that we can still do a lot of contributions that we can make and that's why it's exciting i uh, i co-founded sampling human in 2016 with two other great scientists um uh, and you know our our premise since day one really has been to unravel some of that complexity to make single cell analysis uh, a whole lot easier so basically there's you know, 300 million blood draws that are made each year. And we don't really do single cell analysis on any of those. Uh, so at Sampling Human, we do something special. Uh, so Sampling Human is sort of a startup out of my, uh, out of my lab at the, at the, at the university. Um, we, what, you know, our, our uniqueness are really sort of what, what uh, sets us apart is that we, we unravel that complexity by engineering cells 
to analyze cells. And, um, and you know, by exactly what I mean by that and why, uh, hopefully we'll get, I'll, I look forward to getting into that at this webinar. Yeah, thank you, uh, Daniel. So I do want to double click a bit on some of the aspects you mentioned, longevity, taking off from the complexity mentioned, longevity is a very, very complex field mm -hmm. and it requires an interdisciplinary um, approach. And I, especially in that context, I find your background extremely interesting. Uh, from what I you told me earlier on, which I was fascinated by, is you have a mathematics background. You were a maths professor at the university uh, and then you moved into biology. I really would like to understand how the transition happened, what triggered the transition. Now, when you look at biology, we look at it differently because I've always been into biology all my life. And how would you look at it? What, uh, why this problem of uh, this company or creating this company or the complexity issue fascinates you? Yeah, no, I, I think um, you, so that, that gets to uh, a, a core thesis uh, of, of really the, how, I, how I build teams how I do, how I do my, how I, how we do our work, and there's always two options. You can take a biologist and and then uh, uh, introduce them to a more systematic way of thinking, uh, uh, to to think about how they can use biology as a tool, and you could also do the opposite. Yeah, and and you know both both work. You can uh, you know taking an engineer, and that's really sort of you know that's more dear to me because that that has been my path. As you take someone that has that's an engineer that's a mathematician that is very used to thinking in abstract terms uh and and really you know ultimately they at, at some point in the career you kind of have to settle down uh in one field or another and implement those tools so that you can have an impact and all and you know in the end the most satisfying thing is to have that impact in one area and for me biology is just uh, uh you know it's it's one of these these amazing examples of how how complexity is handled in a very elegant way to do th just you know to to guide our future to you know to, uh, make new things possible yeah so um again uh, trying to understand a little more from you um, do you still miss mathematics are you amply applying it to biology the problem of biology you're trying to solve now uh, well, uh, in our group, scientists spend about half the time at a computer doing uh, mathematical modeling and about half the time in the lab. So um, mathematical modeling is, is yeah, it's, it's, it's huge to our work. So when you moved into biology and given your intelligence and given your uh, background and your uh, way of thinking from whatever I have seen, you could have picked up any problem in biology. And I see you picked up this specific problem to solve. Why is that? What attracted you to this concept of sampling human? Well, uh, yeah, so I, uh, <laughs> a lot of these stories, you know, they, they sort of have the, 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 the funny beginnings and and my lab, uh, uh, so my lab is, is actually in, it's, it's in Europe. It's a little bit outside of a, Pro it's out of Prague in a small city uh, or not a small city. It's decent size, it's an industrial city, Pilsen. Most people probably recognize it for the, uh, you know, for, for, for the beer that you may have on a, on a, uh, uh, on a Friday. Um, and uh, and actually, what one of the things that it's not known for it, it's also home to one of the biggest pathology centers around the world. So, so most of the samples from the Central European region uh, uh, get get brought over to Pilsen for pathological an analysis. And so, cells and analyzing cells is something that you know that that's sort of part of the culture here. Uh, and it was at one of these beer meetings that we had with our colleagues from uh, 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 from the medical uh, faculty. Uh, at the University of Ch uh, Charles University, uh, that we were stumped by the fact that single cell analysis, and this was back in 2016, before single cells were really sort of the en vogue thing. We were stumped by the fact that in practice, single cell analysis really does still boil down to looking at glass slides. Uh, and, and that's something that we felt like, you know, uh, there's a lot of missed opportunity, a lot of missed information that goes on, unseen. 
something that we then ultimately ended up focusing on still while at the university. And then what has generated all this momentum to, to uh, found, and now uh, we've been for, for a while develop the technologies at Sampling Human. Yeah, I remember all about staining and my fingers used to be stained with all the gram positive, gram negative stains that I would do on the slide. That's not only cumbersome, it's so error prone. So having said that, could you just walk the audience through uh, maybe a 4,000 feet height uh, description of what sampling human is all about? What is the core technology? How different is it? And when you talk about single cells, a lot of people would have this question as to what does single cell actually mean? If there is a cell, is it the cells that are accessible for analysis or is it something that is embedded in the tissue, deep within a tissue? How would you do access or how would you um, get out, um, get these samples out in the first place? Oh, a lot of questions people could have. <laughs> That's yeah, anything you can talk tell tell us about that would be interesting. And the next next would be followed by Raghav. He will have questions about the technology. Um, specific okay, so let me technology. let me maybe let me tackle just a, 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 you know part of that question. I think uh, uh, so, you know I think yeah, there's a lot of interesting topics started there. So basically, taking that uh, uh, that mile high uh, uh, the bird's eye view view perspective on why we're excited about about what we're doing uh, and that's and that's you know we we do believe that right now we are sort of at the precipice of new uh, new level of diagnostics new level of understanding the human body uh, and it's not it's not just the next thing so we you know it's not just that okay well we haven't been looking at cells in the past so why not look at cells as well and hope that hope that it brings us something i think there's actually a much uh, uh, a much deeper inflection point, really, that we're that we're standing at right now, uh, the, uh, and that's, I think, the best way of understanding that is to is to think of the body in terms of the hierarchies. Uh, we're at the top of the hierarchy is just the whole body that you know that we've been sort of diagnosing and then trying to understand for 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 millennia, um, and we have some instruments that sort of look at the body as a whole, blood pressure, for instance, and things like things of that nature. Um, then at the next level of the hierarchy, you can think of organs, right? And then the, at the level below that, you can think of, uh, of, of cells and sort of, that's kind of where the, that's where sort of where the story stops. Anything below cells doesn't really have its own homeostasis, doesn't really regulate its function. So really cells are the fundamental building blocks of health and disease. Um, you can, so then how close are we to really understanding cells with the technologies that we have today and why do we need to make new technologies like the ones that we've developed? Well, the answer is quite simple. So we, you know, simply all you have to do is just look, look at your, your, your checkup and the, uh, the, the, the tests that are ordered by your, by your physician the next time you go to, uh, to see him or her. Uh, and, and what you'll find is you'll find various three-letter acronyms, GGT, and, and so on. And usually then when you go and look those up, you, you Google them at home, you'll find that each one of those sort of corresponds to an organ. So it's either, it's either the, 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 the thyroid or the liver or the kidney. And so there's, there's all these molecular tests that, are, that, that we do routinely. But really what we're doing with those tests is we're operating at that middle hierarchy. We're looking at the functionality of organs. Right, and we don't really have tests that go below below that level. Um, what our technology does is it couples the molecular data with the cell type, and it's that coupling now that gives you a, a new level of sensitivity. Uh, it allows you to look deeper into the physiology uh, of a human to be able to understand how those things uh, how those things impact the health. And you may also ask, well, so, you know, we do have, of course, genetic testing. And so where does that fall into the picture as well? Uh, so, so for instance, you, you go and you have, you get your, your, your genome sequenced and, and you look at whether you have any mutations in the, in the uh, 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 BRCA1, BRCA2, for instance, uh, one of these common, common, uh, uh, common biomarkers. And, and I would actually argue that it's those genetic tests that actually highlight even more the need to couple the molecular data. It could even be DNA 
with the particular physiology of cell type. So you take BRCA1, BRCA2, these are, these are genes that are actually expressed in all of the cells in our body. They're important for all cells and mutations in those two genes make you susceptible to cancer, whether you're male, female, and it doesn't necessarily have to be breast or ovarian cancer. It really makes you more susceptible in general because these genes help the cells repair the DNA, any DNA damage. So then in the, so why then are these genes so, so uh, uh, prognostically penetrative for breast and ovarian cancer that people will go to extreme measures to take precautions? So the reason is brought back to, again, coupling cell type with the molecular data. Because what, what, what we've recently found is that while these genes are expressed in all cells, it is in luminal epithelial cells. These are the cells that are present in the breast and in the ovarian tissue that the expression of the mutant variants of these genes causes stress. And that coupled together with an inability to repair the DNA is the ultimate reason why we end up, why we end up seeing such high incidence of these cancers for, for people bearing those mutations. Um, so yeah, so I think what, you know, the, this sort of gives you a little bit of an idea. It's a, it's a, we're, we're, we have an incredible new opportunity that we can seize. We just need new technologies to be able to do so. And that's, that's really what's, what drives us. Fantastic. Uh, now let's introduce the other player, the microbes, right? Uh, so that brings in an additional level of complexity. So microbes or of late, they've been always in news be it a new next uh, MDR strain that requires a new antibiotic to be discovered, or it could be CRISPR that created so much of data delusion, opened up several possibilities. So how do you bring this humble microbe into the equation and create something completely novel? So is that is that my cue where I can now be, uh, where I can geek out a little bit and and and, and, and be more technical? Yes, you can be, please. <laughs> Look, perfect. It's, it's, we always, uh, you know, even though investors like to talk about size of markets and oh, we will we're, get always, there. we're we always, we're always hoping, there. we're always hoping that, you know, there's going to be uh, uh, some, at some point we can, we can discuss the, uh, the technology. So I do have, I do have a few slides here to sort of help, help tell the story. Sampling human, just think of us as the, uh, uh, the Google search in biology for cells. And this is ultimately what we're, what we're striving for is to enable this new level of precision, but to enable it at scale by engineering cells to analyze cells. Uh, uh, but then, you know, you asked about the microbes and, and I always feel like the best way to, uh, uh, to approach these things is to, is to really well define what is the problem that we're solving? Right? What is really our technological contribution? And that's simply to answer this question. Right? How can we ultimately, if we want to do single analysis at scale, it boils down to being able to identify a cell without being able to look at it. Right? We, this, this problem is called the, the identification problem. And it's, and it's notoriously hard to solve. It's not something that's specific to us. So uh, for instance, in cell therapy, you will be faced with a similar kind of problem that Ultimately, the technology has to identify the cell that you want to target. Um, so what is the identification problem? Well, first of all, what is a cell, right? What, well, how do you identify a cell? So cells have a cell type, and the cell type isn't given by any one molecule. It's given by a combination of molecules, antigens that are present on the surface of that cell. And so then the, the identification problem asks this question, you know, are these particular antigens, for example, on antigens A, B, C, and D present? And are they present on the same cell? Right? So it's, it's, it's the combination of those two, two things, the spatial information together with the multidimensional molecular data that makes the problem, that makes the problem difficult to solve. But of course, nature has a lot of different, very elegant solutions on how it can combine information from multiple sources to make very precise decisions. Look at neuronal systems, processing all the senses, immune systems, again, processing the, 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 the place in the body with the particular antigens present. In tissue development, again, a cell being able to tell exactly which role it should play. So there's these various, various uh, systems that are possible. Unfortunately, all of these are very 
specific to a given application and quite com quite complex in themselves, not really making them uh, uh, amenable to, to engineering. But there is a lesson to be learned here. And that's that if we want to combine multiple sources of information within the biological sample, within the reaction, multicellular networks seem to be the answer. Right? So being able to decouple the information processing into cells that then are linked in a very robust way uh, uh, and then that can, that can combine that information. So we, we solve the uh, uh, we solve the identification problem as you've uh, as you've as you've alluded to using microbes, using yeast, the friendly the friendly organism. You know, you, you may you, you most most of the people in the audience probably knows yeast for you know for the dried powder that they just that they just pour into uh, uh, into into their 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 favorite baked baked good. Even even chemists though really look at yeast more as a bioproduction sort of as a, as, a, as a factory. That can produce various valuable proteins that we use in some of these some of these new new products that we're all excited about. But in reality, that's not really what yeast like to do, right? So yeast actually are quite social organisms. They are able to find each other in even in some of the some of the most harsh places and form multicellular networks, exactly like the kind that we need to uh, to build on in order to solve this. Uh, 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 this identification problem, um, and they can be dried, and, and they, you know, you just you just give them a vine leaf uh, uh, in in a vineyard somewhere, and they're they're good to go. So this technology has all of the features that we need. It has all of the basic components, but of course, it's not it's not at all close to actually solving these problems. And it's not modular, programmable in the way that we can then deploy it as a product. This is the part that we've done. So we've we've developed various yeast strains that recognize various surface antigens. Um, we've, we've engineered the strains so that they more specifically communicate with each other. You could think about it almost like a yeast synapse through which these, 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 uh, these cells hook up and combine the information about the various antigens uh, uh, present on a particular surface. And the last thing we did, and this is really important, especially for diagnostics, is we engineered the system so that the difference between the, the, the false positive or the, the difference between the, uh, uh, the, the negative sample and the positive sample, the difference between on and off, the zero and the one is many orders of magnitude, right? And that has, that's, that's been really a, a key factor that has allowed us to achieve incredible performance uh, performance metrics. What I, you know, what what we're more focused on these days is making this really easy to use as well for the for the for the end user. The way that it, you know, the way that it functions is that essentially think beads with logic. The the user comes to us with a with a with a particular cell type. Uh, we simply take yeast strains from our library of antigen recognizing strains and we combine them in a reagent format uh, and in a kit format so that we then give them back a kit that is specific to that cell type that they want to that they want to probe for that they want to analyze uh, really effectively the user then gets our kit they simply rehydrate the the desiccated reagent with their sample uh, of suspended cells or cell clusters, depending on whether they want to analyze individual cells or maybe even cell-cell interactions. There, there's a mixing period with very little hands-on time, basically five to 15 minutes, depending on how proficient the person is. Um, then there's an incubation period where the yeast are allowed to do their thing. And this is about as long as a PCR reaction for those that have experience from the lab. Uh, and at the end, the readout is made. Uh, the most common readout that we're making now is, is simply an enumeration of the particular cell type within the sample. And that's done through measuring luminescence that is produced by a luciferase secreted into, into the medium by, by, uh, by these engineered yeast cells. Um, what, what happens in between, what the, you know, what the cells are doing sort of in, in, that, in, that, in, in that intermediate step is that during the mixing step, they bind to the particular antigens that they're designed for, 
upon binding, they combine the information about the antigens. And if that information matches the targeted cell profile that we're interested in, they exit the dormant state into an on state. And it is in that on state that they, that they, produce, that they produce the readout. But you know, the picture is worth a thousand words in the end. And so this is what one of these multicellular networks looks like on the surface of a, of, of, a, of a lymphocyte. In this case, it's a, it's a, it's a cell line, your cut cell line. Uh, what you can see in this picture though are, are the different cell types, right? The different antigens that they're, that they're recognizing. So I do have some other pictures where we've actually taken the yeast cells and we've colored them according to the antigen that they're recognizing so that you could then tell them apart. And this is what they look like under a microscope. So you can see here, the, the big center, the, the circles that are the big circles in the center, those are the cells that are being analyzed. The little dots on the, on the circumference are the engineered yeast cells. And so you'll see some of these analyzed cells only have the, only have the yellow color, some are only cyan. So those are sort of, they only have one or the other antigen, but some have both. And in this case, that would represent sort of the target cell that we're, that we're interested, interested in. But again, this is sort of just a picture under a glass slide. In reality, this is happening at scale. So here is a, uh, a Z slice of a, of a well from a 96 well plate. And all of these dots are what I previously showed the, the individual clusters. And again, you would find cyan, yellow, and mixed colored dots. And this, and if we took many slices in the well, that you would get a, a, similar, a similar picture. Then, you know, the, lastly, of course, movies worth I don't, know, I don't know what it is these days, thousand pictures. Here is a, is, a, is a time lapse of what one of these yeast synapses looks like, uh, looks like again under a microscope. And what you will see is that uh, the synapse here is, is labeled with the production of a luciferase. So you will see uh, these cells light up as they, as they make the connection, as they exchange information about, about, their, about their respective antigens. So now they, you know, the, you you watch the cells go from the dormant state to the on state, and at which and which stage, this particular cluster is now fully producing whatever reporter protein uh, we we choose to we choose to use. I do want to though also to talk about you know uh, uh, I want to get specific. I, you know for any for any uh, single cell people out there, I want to bring this back down to to earth and compare this to existing technologies. So the, the, the probably the, the most obvious comparison, because you do get a kit, part of that kit is a reagent, the most obvious comparison is to enzymatic methods. In, and the reason, the reason that that's the most obvious comparison is because they're about both about the, the equally easy to use. Of course, in terms of functionality, the, the, two, the two methods are quite different. Enzymatic methods simply measure the total amount of antigen present in a, in a sample, the total amount of protein present in the sample, whereas our technology measures the total total number of cells present in the in a sample. So it's 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 quite different, but still, I think it's an important comparison to make. And this is what you know. This is what the the data shows. The the, the methods really aren't in the same ballpark at all. So the pink line here shows the signal that you get as you increase the total sample size starting from just a single cell on the very left-hand side and going all the way up to a million cells on the right-hand side. Why, and, and, and this is the signal that you get from a single target cell for all these different sample types, sample sizes. And so with, with our technology, you get the same strong single, uh, straight, same strong signal, even if you're analyzing samples that are quite large, whereas enzymatic methods are only good for plus or minus tens of percentage points. Uh, and they, the, the signal from in these methods decays very quickly. The more challenging comparison, of course, is to something sophisticated like a flow cytometer that costs two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You have to be trained to use. Um, that ultimately requires maintenance and, and some headache, but it's a great it's a great tool. Um, so here, the two methods represent uh, provide roughly the same functionality. But of course, the ease of use is strongly in favor of, of our technology. And so this is what the comparison looks like. When we, on the x-axis here, you have flow cytometry readout. On the y-axis, you have our, da our data and, and nice. So this is, this is sort of 
this should this should make you rest rest easy. The two methods give you roughly the same same output. But of course, you know, uh, 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 wait one wait wait a moment, right? There is this what we're really interested in, and 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 you know maybe we could get into into this later in the in the talk is how do these methods give us information about really those important cells, senescent cells, circulating tumor cells, uh, 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 disease specific lymphocytes. So you look at any of these categories that I name, you're, you're talking about cells that are, that are 0 0.01, that make up about 0.01% of the sample. They're quite rare. Uh, so really what we're interested in is how do these methods compare in that little black square near the origin of this graph? And so, that's where the story gets interesting, and uh, and you know I, I'm bringing up a lot of data here, but you know for for the uh, um, for the people uh, for the attendees uh, uh, chat, all you have to know is basically straight line good, same 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 good, uh, curved line bad, uh, uh, different 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 bad, right? So uh, so basically you know the uh, here in this part of the you know when we do look at and compare the data in that small square black box, it's again, the two technologies, even though one is quite more com complex in terms of instrumentation, aren't in the same ballpark. Uh, uh, pretty consistently, our technology operates at the, at the theoretical limit of detection. And it does so across various sample types and various sample, sample treatments. Again, that's, that's important when you're looking to scale this, this data collection. You know, the, 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 the takeaway or the, you know, the, one of the, the question that may be is how does this translate then to this collection of data at scale? How does this translate to inform informational capacity? Simple comparison using, using DOT, this is our platform, uh, diagnostic on target. Uh, to analyze 1 billion cells, it'll take you roughly three hours. Of course, you know, assuming that you, you, you've set things up roughly about, you know, uh, 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 roughly well. Uh, try to analyze billion cells using flow cytometer, you're gonna be sitting there a lot longer, right? And you better get ready that you're gonna be feeding that flow cytometer uh, for quite some time. Of course, performance is only one part of the story. Uh, 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 when we look at how this new approach compares to flow cytometry in any one of these areas, whether you look at sensitivity, scalability, replicability, but even something that you would expect almost with improved performance, you would expect higher cost, but that's not the case because yeast, as you saw in that Fleischmann's, Fleischmann's dry yeast bag, you know, they can be produced by the tons. Uh, so yeah, so the, the cost effectivity is much better here as well. All right, so that was my geeked out uh, part of the talk. Uh, and uh, we can now get to more, uh, more uh, conversational. This is this is this is amazing, Daniel. I, I think this was so insightful into how your technology is really sort of revolutionary in a way. Uh, but I think it's it's worthwhile to ask the question, right? That technologies like FACS have been in development, have been used over decades now, uh, while yours is right. still kind of a new technology. At what stage would you say your technology is at in terms of like, where is your company? What stage your technology is? Is it is it ready to be in production? Are we rolling it out tomorrow? Or is it going to take a few more years to get there? Uh, so if you visit our, uh, this is, I think, a great, uh, great opportunity for me to uh, Sort of uh, uh, plug plug my plug our plug our uh, social media channels. Visit our LinkedIn. Visit our Twitter. We're constantly putting up uh, new information up there about where we are with the company. Uh, if you visited our LinkedIn recently, you would see that we're we just went through our first third party validation. So uh, we've gotten we've gotten really great reviews and and great reception from some uh, 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 from from some clinical and research institutions. Uh, uh, here, sort of within within the within Europe for now, uh, and and now extending to to the U.S. as well. Uh, as far as where we are, so we are in that beta. We are in the beta testing stage. We want to get this right. We want to make sure that. And I think, I think this is partly also driven by the fact, you know, by the stage of the stage of the economy uh, that uh, uh, often often launches. Uh, if if you do need to provide a lot of customer support, can. Uh, 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 can eat up quite a bit of the runway very, very quickly. Uh, and so doing, doing more careful 
beta testing, uh, beta tests, and 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 preparations uh, will will bring will bring value in the future. We're launching a really interesting campaign now. So again, we uh, you know at at sampling human we we want to do we want things to to bring value. We want to build a community whereby science can be can be decentralized to some extent, or at least knowledge sharing can be can be uh, uh, made possible, even for data as complex as single cells. Um, and so we have a, a, an, a an exciting reproducibility project that's going to be the largest multi-center project to compare single cell data that's going to be enabled by by RKID format. Um, this is something that 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 isn't far into the future at all. This is something we're talking end of summer. Uh, the the participants. Of course, they do have to have some of these basic lab skills uh, uh, to be, you know, a, a vortex, a centrifuge, a plate reader. But anyone that has these these basic things can can join in. They will get the kit from us. They will then just send us back the data, and and uh, uh, and we'll we'll really see how far we can push the reproducibility of this technology together. Yeah, that is that is really cool. And so uh, you you just talked about that you're right now in beta uh, beta test. Uh, could you tell us a little more about what is this first application that you're going for and what are kind of the things that are in the pipeline for you? What kind of diagnostic tests are you going to sort of first roll out in a way? Uh, absolutely. So what we, our, our strategy is quite simple. Uh, we're, we're starting research use uh, and, and that's, that's, that's where we build uh, our, our, our user base and that's where we get feedback on applications that how, how, that's where we get feedback and we can really streamline some of these workflows that today take take days and and weeks to do really so we feel like there's a strong need in that area apoptosis uh potency essays uh, uh various cytotoxicity essays that are relevant to qc and manufacturing that are relevant to uh, uh um that are re relevant to monitoring of, of cell therapies uh, so, so all of these research applications are really enabled by just a few markers uh, that uh, uh, that that we have running already in our uh, in our uh, uh, in our library of of antigen specific yeasts. But you know, we're we're passionate about making an impact on health, on making an impact on fields like oncology, like longevity, um, and and with with that regard. It's a it's it's a question of of course it's a, it's a, it's a longer road to diagnostics. We're taking on the the partnership approach, so we want to work with people that that have single cell biomarkers that they're that that they've discovered that they want to commercialize, and we want to give them for the first time the platform that can help them make make that become a reality, make those diagnostics reimbursable and and in in regular practice. That is very cool. Um, so actually I have like two set of questions now I wanna ask you because I, I think you raised some really interesting points here. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first question is kind of gonna take back one of the points that you made about the economy right now, right? That mm -hmm. at this point, the FED report has officially said that we're in re recession and this kind of changes the ground reality of how startups are operating and managing themselves, of course. And in this context, what challenges do you foresee for sampling human uh, and its technology? And overall, what's your mantra for dealing with these uncertain times? Uh, I wanted well, you know. to hear with just one point. I really want our audience to hear about this unique way of decentralizing your operations that you have brought in. I think that is one way in which you can take care of the recession and the inflation, stagflation, all associated aspects. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, uh, yeah, Jyoti, that's a good, that's a great point. We, we do feel like by uh, enabling this sort of dis decentralized or collective uh, analysis by comparison of data, by, uh, by really giving a new functionality to instruments that are easy to use, that are already installed, that's important, already installed in the, the vast majority of laboratories out there. So you look at the plate reader, the, the studies show that there's about one plate reader for every five researchers. We're taking an instrument like a plate reader and we're increasing 
tremendously its functionality. Uh, and, and by then having that, that, that being able to compare the data, again, we're creating even further functionality. Um, so with this approach, by building essentially living information technology, living, living software for plate readers, we really do feel like we can maximize our user base uh, quite a bit and we can grow the market uh, for single cell analysis by bringing in people that normally wouldn't have the funds or the capabilities to do this type of, to do this type of work. Um, as far as, as far as, you know, how, how we are in terms of, in terms of the economy, well, you know, we're focused on, we've, we're excited about growing. Um, and we are at that stage where we are, we are ready to grow. But of course, anyone that's done this before knows that the amount of cash that's, or the amount of money that's required to develop technology is actually small in comparison to the amount of money that you need to be able to grow a company. So we are raising our series A, uh, which is challenging. It's definitely challenging, but, and it's a complex problem, right? To, to, to build a value while also extending your run runway, but we love complex problems, right? This is our this is our thing. So, uh, uh, so we're not we're we're basically turning the screw tighter. We're we're uh, ch uh, we're marking more of the uh, more of the of the boxes, having great interaction with with our users, having projects like this, uh, uh, like the one I just mentioned. Uh, 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 are are all things that we're that are additional things that we're doing to really build credibility, uh, to build to build a user base, to build a community. That is that is that is very insightful, Daniel. Um, so this is a more trivial question, and this is coming from me as a researcher and a longevity uh, hacker myself. Uh, does it mean that it, can I start right? ordering your technologies, uh, ordering these kits and sort of measuring my, uh, uh, and collecting my data for myself and sort of start looking things up. And before you answer that, I wanna pose this question to the audience as well, that if there was a technology like this available, uh, what would you guys be willing to pay for it? So I'm launching a poll right now. So please fill in your answers and we'll get back to those in a minute. So over to you. Push up the price, <laughs> thousands of dollars. <laughs> Over to you, Daniel. Uh, Why don't you answer now? So, uh, yeah. So, getting back to getting back to your question, if you're interested in if you're interested in using this technology, we uh, contact us uh, uh, and and we'll get you in on this project. Really, we do want to make this as open as possible. Um, and and uh, yeah, and uh, you 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 know, there's there's a, there's a, a, a an onboarding uh, process. Um, upon which we then you know then we we do of course you know the, the natural thing is that uh, anyone that we give this early access to we do expect some some co cooperation some co collaboration in return so that we can make the product better uh, uh but yeah contact us that is that is amazing uh, so actually i just got the poll results back and it seems like a majority of people are willing to pay above hundred dollars. So about 57% are willing to pay above hundreds of dollars in the range of hundreds of dollars. And 29% are down for thousands of dollars. So there you go, there's your price point right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I think Jyoti has a couple of questions now. So yeah. I'll hand Does it, it over disappoint to you, Daniel? Are you upbeat about the no. poll results? Because I actually, you know I think what I'm... the expectation here is because I know I have been up lab rat for a large number of years in my life, wearing a white coat and speaking only to my test tubes and pipe admins and no one else, right? I enjoyed that phase of my life and I understand how tedious it is to use some of the cytometry equipment that exists out there and what kind of training it needs and how much of sample bias, the user bias exists in those analysis. That's why sometimes it's so difficult to reproduce anything that's out there in the public domain. So is, since this is a, a leap or, or a significant inflection over what exists in the market, I think you should be able to set the kind of uh, price point that you think uh, makes sense, right? So yeah. what would that be? I mean, you can ignore this question if you don't want to answer it right now. Uh, well. First of all, we you know we we do think that part of the problem with single single cell analysis is the lack of data. That problem is ex exacerbated further when we look at single cell data for rare cells. And I could talk about some of the clinic some of the exciting clinical work that that's out there looking at various cell types. In all those cases, those 
those cells are rare. So you need to be able to uh, 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 process quite a bit of samples to build up the knowledge base. Uh, uh, so with that being said, we want to promote liberal, liberal use. We do want, we are looking to democratize single cell analysis, both in terms of the ease, as well as in terms of the price point. Um, with the, of course the the research products, diagnostic products, those you know we're talk, we are talking about two different two different things, um, and and uh, the investments required to bring those products to market are also different. Um, but with that being said, I think you know our, our just just like the it's it, so it won't be free like the Google search bar, uh, uh, but we do want to make sure that we do change the economies so that. So that we empower the empower the ecosystem. Fantastic. Uh, so, you know, if I were to define your technology in one sentence, I would say it's packs in a test tube or fluorescent <laughs> yeah. sort of that's test right. tube that can be yep. done. So um, that's futuristic enough. But if I were to challenge you because of your background and your complexity and the way you think. What is the future for uh, sampling human? What, what Ooh, is the okay. future? Yeah. Uh, so we do have actually, there's, so we're doing a, 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 a Twitter, uh, a, a, a series of Twitter posts that are called sampling, and it's always a name. So sampling someone else in the company. And one of the questions that we ask is, where do we see ourselves in, in the, in the, uh, in the 10 to 20 year or five year period or whatever that person chooses. And ending sort of this reproducibility crisis definitely is one of those things on, on the list. Uh, being able to combine the, for the first time, molecular data with cell types to have actionable information uh, to, to enable for people to better understand their, their health state. You know, this, this is something to, you know, to be able to answer question like, questions like, is this fill in the blank? Is this good for me? Right. So that you don't have to, you don't have to depend on some sort of gossip that you can actually answer this. So you could have really, truly a personalized information. So having, it, having the technology be, um, be as easy to use and distribute as that, uh, you know, I think that, I think that would be a great thing. Yeah. So today the, theme of all our uh, webinars is longevity. So mm. all these futuristic uh, applications you are looking at, what part of it is for longevity and what would those be? Just give a couple of examples, please. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, with well, definitely one of the coolest things and, 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 you know, during our lunches, we're always talking about things like uh, one of the coolest things I've probably over the past five years has been epigenetic clocks. Right. I mean, this is just how amazing is that we can tell the biological age of, of cells and of organisms. Uh, you know, the, if, if I was to take it, if, I think if there is a takeaway lesson from genetics is that it is so cell, cell type specific. Same is true for epigenetics. And, and I think Vladim's group, group is one of the groups that are really showing sort of the diversity of, of epigenetic data from various cell types. So if you're then looking to make therapies, uh, if you're looking to somehow reverse that age or improve it, it's absolutely important that you realize what are those, what are those epigenetic sites that are important for the various cell types, and to and to make interventions that are specific to those. Uh, so I, you know that that's one that's one uh, 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 one area. Also, though, senescent cells. Uh, there isn't a single senescent single type of a senescent cell out there. It's again many different types. They're rare. We need more information about those. And once we do have that information, then we need tools that are going to enable us to monitor these cells so that we know whether this particular lifestyle is toxic or good for that particular person. Fantastic. And if we, I think we, that's another discussion between you and me. We definitely do want to look at additional assays for senescent and cells and we can develop it together. Having said that, Raga was a couple of more uh, polls uh, so that we get more audience feedback and then we will have just one last question for you and we'll close the session. I know we have gone over right. 
you're such an interesting speaker so i can't help but ask more questions to you i knew i knew this could go on for hours yeah <laughs> so thanks jyoti so just uh, as we are wrapping up the uh, webinar and i think jyoti has one last question i want to ask one last question to the audience which is what did you think of the webinar how well did you understand uh, this really amazing technology that daniel uh, shared with us today so i'm just launching a poll for that uh, feel free to answer in the poll and we'll no, actually honest feedback is good here we do we're constantly working on improving our wording and communication so yeah my last question as people are answering and raghav comes in with the results before that let me uh, finish my question how can we help you so i know you uh, no uh, entrepreneur is runs is able to run the journey alone so we want to support you in this and we have i'm sure we have some of the audience who can pitch in as well so what kind of support would you expect from uh, us and the rest of the audience here well so if you're an investor right call call me <laughs> uh, I'm, uh no but in all honestly i mean i think build, building up the community in um uh i've already mentioned the reproduce reproducibility project this is a great way for uh for people to engage with us uh, uh you know please uh, please do get in into contact uh, contact with us if you have if you have access or if you're at all connected to to some laboratory space um and what we also find is feedback from from different people is also different based on their experience and their needs and we want to make sure that we consider consider those differences as as, as well um we visit our visit our website we're hiring so that may all, that's you know that's that's another that's an op, another opportunity if you're a scientist or if you're um if you're a a, a highly capable uh, executive uh you know we have we have position all those positions uh, that we're recruiting for right now. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Daniel. And so I just got the audience poll back and it seems like uh, over 80%, actually 85, more than 85% of the people believe that they understood the uh, the webinar fairly well. They scored it above four, four and above and more than 56%. Okay, so. Percent, so that that they understood it completely. So I think this was pretty much a success you really all right your technology really so professor he was a professor <laughs> right so it's expected out of uh, daniel hey and just one last question before, as we wrap up this was a fantastic session thank you so much for the investors out there could you please tell them are you raising money now if so what are you looking at and what yeah. could be the market potential i don't even i didn't even bring it up because for me this has billions of dollars of market potential because the extension capabilities and this can be applied to any field of diagnostics or even discovery, for example, in biomarkers, right? So that's why I didn't even bring in that typical um, investor question market. of what is the market size. But if you do want to make a point there, I would welcome that. And thank you all so much. Thank you all for joining us. And this was a fantastic one hour that we've spent. Over to you, Dan. Well we are raising we're raising uh, uh, our series a we're uh, we're looking for a 15 million round uh, the you know the the objective of it is really growth so that's growth in the commercialization team growth in our product portfolio growth in uh, innovation to basically be able to make much more powerful impact on on all the different fields jyoti that that you mentioned and of course, it, you know the growth in the bottom line. That's that's uh, that's always nice to see as well. Um, as far as uh, what was the second part of the uh, the question? The, if you want to talk a little bit about the market size, as you see, oh, the market size. Yeah, absolutely. So we're launching already. Like I've I've already mentioned, we're launching this year. That's the two and a half billion market, and it's and it's just with these initial products. We're we're carefully picking the applications to target some of the most. Uh, most commonly performed uh, 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 immunophenotyping assays right now, like uh, like I already mentioned, cell activation apoptosis, potency assays that are for which there's a large need, unmet need right now, but either in terms of throughput uh, or in terms of functionality of the tests. And then the, the, as far as the market growth beyond that, it's as Jyoti has mentioned. So each one of our growth uh, growth stages captures more and more of the TAM uh, in the diagnostic sectors, uh, but not only that. 
uh, the the application is really it goes it goes beyond diagnostics. Fantastic. Um, Raghav, do we close the session? Do you yeah, have anything uh, to add? No, I just want to thank Daniel for sharing this really amazing technology with us. And uh, it was great to hear you talk about it. I, uh, Jyoti had to told me how good you were at speaking, but now I can really vouch for it. And I've seen it in real time. Uh, so thank you for coming on the webinar today. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Raghav and uh, Daniel. Bye. Jyoti, Raghav, chat. Thanks. Bye. Bye.